Hi, everybody, and welcome to the seventh edition of our live show here in lockdown London, beginning as ever with a big shout out to everybody on the front line who's working hard, risking their lives in many cases so that we can all try to be healthy and well moving forward. So big shout out to all of them. Thank you again. And we are starting a fundraising uh, charity for COVID. There will be details at the bottom of this video in the description area. So have a look for that. It's just, you know, if you feel like donating some money, we'll put it to a good cause. And anything that comes from this specific show, this is all part of our channel network, but from this specific show, then uh, that will go to a charity close to our hearts as well, all related to COVID. Anyway, moving on, we have a different sort of show today because we have a special guest who's gonna join us online any second. And in addition to that, and in response a little bit to last week's show when we showed the 78 South African Grand Prix and there was a bit of Gilles Villeneuve in there, we've found some more footage courtesy of the brilliant AP archive. This is again Kailami, South Africa. Don't ask me why, but it just happened to be 79 South African Grand Prix, which was Gilles Villeneuve's second Grand Prix victory. And there's a lot of it. And I thought, shall I just edit it down to a couple of minutes as normal. And I thought, no, let's sit with this and try to make it look like a sort of Grand Prix weekend and go through it from beginning to end. So it's about 17 minutes of great color footage that's coming up a little bit a little bit later on in the show. And there's a little bit of soundbite with Jill at the end as well. Not me asking the questions, but uh, nonetheless, you get to hear Jill's voice and, and you get to, get to feel a little bit of his elation after the race. So that's coming up. And in addition to that, a bonus to that, I've also, because I took that decision, I've also um, put onto our new podcast platform, which is, uh, again, description will be at the bottom of this, uh, this with a link. We'll put it there, podbean.com it's called, but it's a great new platform. I've done a, uh, all my audio notes from that race. I was there that weekend, hanging out a lot with Jill, as a matter of fact, and I put that onto a podcast. So you can listen to that and then watch the video later on again, because it'll be on our channel, or, or you can watch the video and then listen to the podcast. It's up to you, but um, hopefully you'll enjoy them both. So it's a real Jill Villeneuve fest. Anyway, moving on to our special guest today. Again, this is um, in response a little bit to what uh, you, the fans, have been saying. Let's try to get some uh, some guests on the show. And we're very lucky to have, or I'm very privileged to have, uh, Inam Ahmed join us on this show. And, and that's for two reasons. One, three, actually. Inam is a really, really cool guy. He's articulate. He's witty. He's a very good person too, I think. I've spent a little bit of time with him and got to know him quite well. Secondly, he's a very, very fast racing driver, but he's an interesting racing driver because he's not one of these identity kit drivers that you just plug in and you get what you expect all the time. He's very unpredictable, he has brilliant days. He has some not so brilliant days, which he's very happy to talk about and talk about on a, in a human level as well. To me, he's a real human being, I guess, is what I'm really saying. Uh, so I like that about him. And thirdly, um, he is uh, just recovering from COVID-19, incredibly, and he had it really badly. So I think it's a really um, apposite moment to talk to Inam. So I'd like to welcome him now to the show. I think you're there online, Inam. Yeah, hi, Peter. Thanks. So yeah, hi, buddy. Um, I hope your ears haven't been burning. We've just been talking to you about you for a little bit. <laughs> But um, welcome, first thing. Secondly, COVID-19. Tell us about that. You've had a bad run with that, right? You look great yeah, now, well, I to say. No, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay now, thank God. But um, I got it. Uh, well, it hit me when I knew I got it on the Monday that we were supposed to travel to Bahrain for the first race, actually. But luckily, the race got postponed. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I wouldn't have been able to go. Um, and I only started feeling a symptom the day before when in the evening I just started coughing without, and I, but I couldn't stop myself from coughing all of a sudden like around seven eight o'clock at night um didn't think too much of it just maybe thought it was a bit of dust but it wasn't stopping woke up the next day and I was completely like finished I couldn't move and I was such a high temperature and then I was out of it for like three or four weeks at least you know? and only it took me well over a month before I could like start to exercise and move you know i was getting really tired very easily it was difficult it was very difficult 
Now that's that's shocking to hear. I mean, you are a fit young athlete, what twenty years old, I guess now. Yeah. Yeah. Fit racing driver, fit, and you got it that badly. Uh, I guess this is a very difficult question to answer. But do you know how you got it? A hundred percent. I think I got it in London because um, we were testing like two weeks or just over two weeks before I really got it in Bahrain, and no, no one in my team got it. So I don't think I got it from there. Uh, even if I got it there, I would have passed it to them for sure. Uh, so a hundred percent, I got it in London. Uh, which is, wouldn't surprise me because we, we were the last country to go into lockdown anyway and everyone was normal. And then I, I got ill like three or four days before the lockdown. Oh no, or a week. Three or four days or a week? No, a week before the lockdown started actually. A week or two before the lockdown started. So uh, I think maybe I should have taken more precaution. <laughs> yeah, but what sort of precaution? Uh, I mean, presumably social distancing was just starting to come into play at that point, was it? Or I, I, don't, I don't think the... For me, I don't get too close to people anyway, but I think it's just, I touch stuff without realizing. Like hand, like when I use public transport, like the tube, I'll, I think it's just when I touch stuff. And then even though I try to sanitize my hands, you, you'll never do it as frequently as you should. And then you'll touch your face without realizing, and then you got it, and then that's it. <laughs> and those, when you had it really badly, you stayed at home, I guess, you didn't go to hospital? No, 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 I stayed at home because I knew I, it was really bad, but I knew it wasn't life-threatening like it was to other people. So, I, you know, other people needed that space in the hospital, and I knew I'd be okay. So I just waited out at home, and then I, um, you know, my my chiropractor who follows me to all my racing, he gave me supplements to take. So I'm taking mm. vitamin A, vitamin D3, zinc, obviously vitamin C, and also um, astragalus root. It's like a plant basing, you put it into water and it really boosts your immunity because uh, uh, it does a lot with homeopathic stuff. So that, that really, really helped my recovery and also helped my parents because I passed, obviously I passed on to my, my whole family <laughs> without realizing. And, and then, uh, they got it, but they, well, they, they didn't get it as bad as me, luckily, because they loaded up on the, the supplements that we were taking. And uh, my dad had it for about a week. Because my dad never gets sick, ever. And uh, it was like the first time I've seen him sick in like six years. Mm -hmm. but he had it for about a w over a week. Mm. And then my mum had it as well. She had it for about five days. But luckily, th luckily they didn't get it bad as, as bad as me. And I can only thank God for that, really. Mm. Um, um, and in that worst period, presumably you lost quite a lot of weight. You're in a fever, right? Yeah, yeah. I was sweating so much. I couldn't eat. So I didn't eat... For like two and a half weeks, I'd say I couldn't, I could barely eat or even drink water. And uh, when I went to see my doctor about a week or two ago, I did a weigh-in with her, and I was five over five kilos lighter than what I was since January, which is not a bad issue actually, because you know I needed to lose a little bit of weight. I needed to use it, lose a kilo anyway, so I could just wow. maintain this weight, you know. So yeah. <laughs> Well, it's good to see you now. I mean, when did you start to feel better and how long, how far into your recovery are you now? I mean, how fit are you now? So I got it, I got it March, around March 20th, March, yeah, around March 20th, 22nd. And I'm okay now. Um, mashallah, luckily, thank you God, I'm very, really, really okay. Um, it's Ramadan now, so I'm fasting. It's the 14th day and we got 16, 16 more days to go. Um, and I think that that builds my immunity as well, actually, because fasting really helps the body recover because you're replenishing all the old cells that um, the body couldn't get rid of because now your digestive system has a chance to rest because you're not drinking anything or eating anything. Your body takes care of all the toxins and the bad cells in your body that it couldn't before. And it's part of my religion to do it for a month anyway. So <laughs> I'm doing it. <laughs> Well, hats off to you for that. Uh, a lot of courage to do that, I think, after what you've just been through. I and mean, it's interesting to hear you speak so positively about the effects of fasting, because that's not something we hear about in a public forum at all. And I guess anybody in power would never recommend that anybody fasts. But at the same time, what you say does make sense. And I, I was going to raise the point, actually, that you are, a, you are a Muslim and you're quite open about it and you follow your faith 
quite strongly, correct? I mean, which makes yes. it very unusual amongst racing drivers. Yes, well, um, especially this uh, lockdown, you know, with every, with every bad thing is in life, there's also um, a good thing to come out of it. And uh, I used it to just learn more about my religion that I couldn't do when I was younger because I was always traveling, racing, you know. And um, I've learned even more about Islam, you know, and it's such a beautiful religion. I'm really proud to be a part of it, you know. Mm. There is a lot of talk about ethnic minorities at the moment, and, and I think in your sector, they, in your area, Muslim community, one of the problems you have is the generational feel, correct? And yeah, have, yeah. You have a lot of families of various generations living together, which is, which is obviously an issue in, in this situation. But having said that, in general, the Muslim community looks to be doing quite well, covid -wise. Yes, well, generally, um, yeah, especially particularly with the British Asian community, we have um, the elder people tend to get illnesses, like diabetes is very common, things like that. And uh, also in my culture, is, um, we look after our parents, you know, we, you know, to the to the day they pass away, we, we, we never let them go. And my bro my mum has 10 brothers and sisters, my aunties and uncles, and they look after my, my grandmother, for example. And uh, in our culture, we, we, we stick together as a family like glue like we never leave like the grandmother's house you could say until you get married but even when you get married you're still there a lot and now since it's lockdown because we have to be careful with my grandmother because she's uh, very old and she has health problems as well yeah uh it's a shock because now only one person can stay with, with her my auntie and she doesn't leave the house either because obviously if she leaves she can get it without knowing uh well, and usually in the house is like five six seven people saying that usually in, in our culture that's normal so <laughs> that's the difference. And I'm putting putting the COVID experience to one side and just talking about the fasting and working out, which I guess you're having to do now because the season is going to restart at some point. Just to go through that, you're not eating any food or drinking any fluids at all, including water no, during the yeah. day. And so within the period when you're working out, you're not taking any fluids in. No, yeah, 100%. That's what makes it harder. So actually now after I do the interview with you, because we break the fast today, Today it breaks at 8.40, around that time, or 8.35. So up until then, when I finish the interview with you, then I'll be doing some exercise. Because if I do it too early on in the day, I'll be way too thirsty. The main thing you feel more than hunger, for me, hunger is not too bad, it's the thirst. You really mm. appreciate water, which we all take for granted, like drinking. It, like we drink so much liquids throughout the day. And when you really can't have a liquid, you really see the effects of how much it affects your body when you're not able to be hydrated properly. Well, we, and when we hear so much about the importance of hydration and, and water in, in any athletic environment, it reminds me a little bit, actually, of um, cricket-wise. You probably don't know about cricket, but, but I, I was actually at the Oval Test. It must have been, I don't know, five or six years ago when Hashim Amla, who's a, a Muslim South African player, hit, I think he scored something, something over 300, like 311, which was a massive score. He batted for two and a half days or something in heat during Ramadan and and they have drinks breaks in big international cricket matches every hour I think and not once in any of the drink breaks did he take a sip of water and I thought I was just blown away but I'm blown away actually by what you just said as well I think it's amazing how how strong your faith is for you and that you can do that and again all I can say is hats off really Thanks. impressed yeah, well, fasting is really, 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 really important in my religion. Um, it's like something that to show your devotion to God and, uh, you know, it also makes you appreciate what other people. The reason why, like when people fast for a benefit, like if they're not for a religious reason, they just don't have food and they drink water. But for us, we don't have the water as well because it's to make you appreciate people who don't have access to either around the world. And when you do it, it really teaches you about patience because I'm still doing stuff that I would normally do in the day, like I'm doing my simulator every day. And in the beginning of the fasting, it was really hard to keep my patience and my anger subdued when something bad happened, like if I get crashed into an eye racing or something. But now, like, it's taught me how to be really calm and have patience, you know? It's yeah, really well, brilliant. Um, and this going straight into racing now. We, we will get into racing now because you are a racing driver at the end of the day, and I know yeah. that's what, what this is all about. But... Um, James, I, I know what you're going to say here, but James Higgins says, Hi, Anam, have you ever raced at Zandvoort? What was your experience? Uh, and Peter, how much do you miss going to Zandvoort? Well, I know what you're going to say story. about Zandvoort, right? <laughs> I have a funny story at Zandvoort. I, I went to Zandvoort in 2018 and I was leading the European F3 Championship at the time. And 
I was just, I was probably overconfident. And I just sent the car in the high speed corners. Like I didn't care. I was just had no fear. And the, 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 the second fast, there's like two really fast corners. And the second one, I just sent it way too fast, you know. I tried, I kept it flat to the apex, then I released, which is when I look at it now, it's so stupid. But anyway, hit the bump in the middle, and I, I just got fired off to the arm curl and to the left. That was my weekend ever, pretty much, because I missed the whole of FP2, and I qualified, like, it's like 14th or something. And it's, it's like Macau, it's one of those tracks where you need, a, mm. like, a rhythm, you know, because it requires a lot of confidence. That was my last experience that time for <laughs> Well, yeah, I, 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 you say it was a funny experience. I mean, I'm glad you can laugh about it now. But, and, and that's typical of you, I've got to say, that you are a guy that can uh, you enjoy your racing, win, lose or draw, which I think is what I was trying to say a bit earlier on, not saying it very well. From my point of view, Zandvoort, yeah, I love Zandvoort. Uh, the Zandvoort I know, of course, is different from the Zandvoort that even you raced on. It's the one with the much longer straight and the very quick corner leading onto that long straight. And because it's a long straight, there was always a massive amount of overtaking going into the Tarzan hairpin. More difficult now with the shorter lap and the shorter straight, of course. But that's, you know, whatever. Why they do these things, who knows? Yeah. But my memories of Zandvoort are being near Amsterdam, a city I love, um, being near the beach, a great beach there. And the town as well, it's a real carnival atmosphere because it's in the, when, I, when it's the Dutch Grand Prix, it was a relatively small town. I guess it's much bigger now. Uh, and everybody got hold of the Grand Prix. And we all stayed at the Bows Palace or near the Bows Palace, which is the big hotel, the casino hotel there. And it was just great fun. It was a great race. And you could go out onto the sand dunes and watch on the very quick corners. You could stand behind the pits and watch them go through the Hunza Rug. You could be on the pit pit wall and still see a lot of the circuit in other words it's a really really nice track for that what it's going to be like now i hate to think well and there'll probably be a bit of the character still there but i do remember taking frank williams out uh, to watch it must have been about uh, i guess it was about 80 81 we went out to the i said frank you've got to come and watch the cars out the back it's really really impressive and frank's always there with his stopwatches on the pit wall um, so he said, yeah, okay, okay. And we went off and, um, and I, I, you know, Prost was mega quick in the Renault with Michelin qualifying tire grip and like just absolutely perfect. And um, he did his pole lap right in front of us. And we were on that right hander where you go over the brow, really quick corner. Yeah. And um, I said, looked at Frank and, you know, after it was all over and said, wasn't that amazing, Frank? And he said, well, when are they going to go quickly? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, that was it. That was the pole lap. And he said, it didn't look quick at all. I always thought, well, that's, you know, I guess because they weren't sliding or doing much. And, and it was also just flash, flash past his eyes. But also that was quite a... And also for me, Zandvoort is... Um, it's actually synonymous with Nigel Mansell. One, when he had an amazing qualifying performance there in 80, in, when he got into Elia De Angelis' car at the last minute. And secondly, it was at Zandvoort that I had to virtually... Um, just knock on the door of Frank Williams' caravan, as it was. It wasn't a motorhome, a caravan, uh, endlessly to get him to open the door to talk about hiring Nigel for 1985. And I'd had about six attempts to persuade Frank to hire Nigel, and every one of them, he'd ducked it. And eventually, Nigel said, look, just tell him I don't want to drive for him. So I eventually went up. It was like Saturday night, 7 o'clock, knocked on the door. Frank had just got in from his run, and I said, Frank message from Nigel, he doesn't want to drive for you next year, even if you make the offer. And he said, no, you can't be serious. I said, well, that is, uh, <laughs> is serious. Sorry. I hate, to, I hate to say it. And um, next morning, he said, go and get Nigel. Let's do the deal. And that's how we got the deal done for Nigel to go to Williams. That was in 84. Uh, so it was hard work, but that all happened at Sandvoort. So fond memories of that. Um, I've got to say, talking not to you now, Nam, but to the world at large, that you are very, very talented, brilliant in karting, dominated the British Formula 3 championship. You've won in European Formula 3. You've won in Japanese Formula 3. And now you're doing a season of FIA Formula 3, hopefully to get up that next rung of the ladder towards Formula 1, where I think you'd go really well uh, if you were given the right opportunity has to be said. Uh, but just so we can move, uh, we can show everybody how good you are. I'd like to run a little bit of uh, tape now. I think they used to say run the tape. Uh, yeah. I'd like to run a bit of video of a race last year at Fuji in the wet. And it is it was about middle of the year, I think. Yeah, and yeah, middle of the year. Are, I'll let you do the commentary, but it's very wet. It's typical Fuji. Rains a lot there in Japan. And you're racing against one of the key 
fast Toyota yeah, yeah, runners, big engine. Right. Yeah, so let's run that, and you can you can do the commentary and um. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I was catching him through the whole race, and then my lines were very different to him. I found grip right on the edge of the track, which he wasn't exploiting, and my and as you can see, I was crisscrossing him like a slalom, and I was able to turn the car whenever I found the grip, like here. And I knew I had to slow him down for the last corner because the Tom's engine was, in Japan, it's really, really fast. And, it's, uh, and then I overtook him here. And um, I knew he was going to drive straight back past me on the straight because it's expected. Uh, but I was able to show how much better I was than him in the wet, you know. And uh, I got back in the slipstream and it was still really difficult to overtake him. This is where the Tom's engine pulls really, really well. Uh, so then I get straight back behind him. And then, for some reason, he, he decided to break on the rubber. So I braked on the inside, but there was loads more grip and done him. And then that was about it. Then I left him. That was Miyate. It was his third season of Japanese F3. And it's incredible when you go out there. Like, they, they do F3 for so many years. And he's doing F3 again for a fourth year this year, which is incredible. You know, the, the guy's just come second, I think, three years in a row in F3. He's going to do it till he wins. <laughs> He's like 24, 25, something like that. But it's a good guy, you know. <laughs> They're really dedicated out there. In, um, uh, you are, if I can butt in here, you were kind of generalizing at the end there. But to me, the best bit of that whole sequence is the last bit when it looks like he's going to, because he's on the inside coming out, it looks like he's going to get back in front of you. But you just stay there on the outside and hold it for the next left hander and then it's all over. Thank yeah, I kind, of, uh, but, but, I kind of like uh, understand. Yeah. I knew I was going to understeer, so I just kind of used him as a brake, so I understeer, so I forced him wide, so I could carry out. Otherwise, he was going to cut back. That overtake took about three quarters of a lap by the look of it. It was brilliant. Yeah. Really good. You don't see that very often in motor racing, and the fact that it was wet obviously made it happen, and you were looking for the grip, and you found the grip. And that just shows, I think, how much talent you got. Anyway, um, I won't go on and on about that but some questions coming in lots of questions coming in thank you very much to everybody um symbol resolution says Enam, how does the formula three in real life compare to formula three in i racing uh oh funny one when i drove the baseline it was nothing like real life absolutely it was like nowhere near enough grip but then someone gave me a really good setup on i racing and then uh since i got a really good setup it feels quite close to the real thing which is really weird so it's very setup dependent, but it, it's, it's where it's similar is that in the old F3, if you get rotation right and you make the car kind of do like this on the entry to the corner and you nail the throttle really early, it rewards you a lot, just like it did in the original car. Um, if you get away with like turning very minimal and like lean, you know, and getting the rotation really well. And that's where on iRacing, it's more difficult to do that. But when you do it on iRacing, it rewards you a lot. Because uh, I think that's what, when I watch Lando, that's what he, he's really good at. He's done so many laps on iRacing and he, he's able to do it nearly every lap, you know, when I watch him. So, speaking, uh, of which, speaking of which, Naeem Ali says, Inam sounds just like Lando. Hope to see you in Formula One soon. <laughs> uh, I think that's a compliment, Inam. Um, <laughs> Mina Tormith says, Inam, as you were growing up, who were your racing idols? I feel old asking this, but can you remember Michael Schumacher at Ferrari, or are you too young? <laughs> you know, the, the first Grand Prix I ever watched was nothing. I never thought about being a racing driver. I can't remember which year it was, but it was the years where Schumacher was in Ferrari. I remember it was a wet Silverstone. I can't remember how old was I, I was. I was either between the ages of three and six. And it was when it was really loud. And I just remember this one shot of seeing Schumacher come past me in the red Ferrari. It was raining in Silverstone, British Grand Prix. The only Grand Prix I ever went to. Then the next Grand Prix I went to was British Grand Prix when I won the British Championship in Cadet Karts in 2012. And, but when I watched the Grand Prix, I never thought about racing. I, just, I remember I was really scared of the noise. of the v, I think it was the V10s, must have been, because it was so loud and I was crying to my dad. <laughs> so who were your idols when you were growing up did you have any uh schumacher even though i didn't want to be a racing driver at the time i, I had no idea what racing was so i just idolized schumacher michael because he was winning everything so you're always going to idolize the winner just like a uh, basketball fan would i idolize michael jordan mm -hmm. um and then lewis hamilton when he when he won the world championship in 2008 that's what got me that's what gave me the idea to go to a go-kart track. And then I went to a go-kart track, and then I, then I loved it, and then I just carried on from there. 
So you could say Lewis Hamilton winning in Brazil. I remember watching that race with my parents. That kind of gave me the spark. And then that gave me the idea to try to go into a go-kart. And then that's everything was history after that. As Zubar Ahmed says, hi, Nam. What's been the biggest challenge so far getting into Formula 3? And how do you feel about this year? Uh, the biggest challenge is being able to get the sponsors together to be able to do it. I'm very lucky to have three uh, really big sponsors behind me. Uh, I have New Point Capital, one of the biggest insurance companies in the world, and also Discover Us, which is actually a friend of mine. And uh, it's an app connecting all new businesses uh, in London. Really good friend of mine, Massimo, he, and uh, I'm very lucky to have him. And um, another, another sponsor is a restaurant called Location, so I'm really, really happy to have them on board. Otherwise, I probably would have done another year in Japan. But Europe is where I wanted to race. It's, you know, Formula One is my, my dream, my goal. And when I was able to do that, uh, I didn't look back. I said, I'm going to do it. And um, quite simply, I'm going to win the championship this year. Even though it doesn't look like it after a Bahrain test, I think I was last in the inaugural uh, testing results. I, you know, some people in life have an off day. I had an off test. I was off for all three days, so I uh, <laughs> forget that. That was really bad. But it may not be believable, but in my head, I'm going to win the championship, quite simply. Can you give us a feel for what it's like for teams like Carlin and, and other teams at the moment in this lockdown period? How difficult is it for them? Uh, well, actually, Carlin, I don't know what other teams are doing, but I think Carlin, uh, Trevor's dealing with it the best because all the engineers... With my engineer and the drivers, we're doing our own private sessions on iRacing. We're doing our own private Carlin Racing Championship in F3. And we're treating it like it's a real thing, like real race weekends, testing. We talk to our engineers to set, uh, set up the cars, to do everything. So it's like, it's, it, and I'm loving it at the moment. I'm actually loving the lockdown because I'm on, you know, I'm, I actually had this sim for five years. I just moved it over to the, uh, my, you know, my parents, we moved to the new, uh, apartment. And... Uh, now I'm on it like 24-7. I'm just looking at it over there. <laughs> now I'm on it all the time and I absolutely love it. I'm just waiting for some more upgrades to come on the monitors because they're a bit laggy. And I'm loving it because it's like real life. Like and with Stefan, the chief engineer, Carlin, my engineer, James, like we're, we're all doing it. And, you know, and we're really competitive against all the other drivers. And then also I'm racing against some of my friends like Max Futrell, Ed Jones. We're doing other races on iRacing. It's really enjoyable. I'm actually doing so many kilometers of mileage every day, you know, and it's fantastic. And I'm learning stuff that I never thought I would learn, actually, on the sim, because I've always been the type of guy, I'm not really a big fan of sims, mainly because I've never been naturally that good on sims, but I'm working really hard to become better at a si simulator. Um, and I'm enjoying it now, and I'm becoming okay now. I'm, just, I'm competitive now, so I'm happy. And have you got uh, any sort of feel in your own mind for when you think you might be back in a race car? Uh, most, I think July is what they're saying. I hope so. I just want to get going, you know, because um, uh, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a long wait. And as a driver, like I always have this fire burning in my stomach, and it's just getting more and more and more, and I can't sit still. Like so that's why I'm on the sim all the time. I got to release this energy somehow, you know, and I release onto the sim. <laughs> so you know, so a closest thing I've got. Plus the fasting, plus the COVID recovery. It's all happening in arm. It's all happening. Yeah. Now I enjoy the fasting because, you know, my mum makes my mom is, makes such good food. <laughs> and in this lockdown, it's encouraged her to make fresh food every day. Indian food because, you know, I'm, uh, I'm British Asian originally. So I, I'm having curry every day. It's brilliant. And, my, you know, my mum's making chicken now next to me and it smells great. And when you really eat that food, when you break the fast, you really appreciate how good the food and the water tastes. It's, it's really incredible. I'm sure you do. We've got some other general questions coming in. So chime in whenever you want, but it's kind of related to what we've been doing on the show so far. Last week, I actually uh, went way out on a limb and suggested that we completely revamp the way we went Formula One racing. And we auctioned yeah. the drivers for every race and they got into – whatever car the auction bid allowed them or stipulated, and they could only do six races in one team in the course of a year, and they couldn't do two in a row. We've had quite a lot of feedback from that, oddly enough. Um, one of them is from David McLaughlin, who, uh, it was an email actually, who said, um, you know, he obviously is very intrigued by the idea, and he sees the parallel in that he's a rugby fan also, 
oddly supports Wales. Cannot imagine why <laughs> Australia being the number one. To, uh, sorry. Um, but <laughs> he gravitated towards watching NFL and thought NFL was, you know, nothing until he suddenly got hold of what the NFL draw was all about and how well that was run and how big that is for the sport. And then said he can see why this could work in Formula One with the parallels. And he's added a couple of bolt-ons to my suggestion, which is that the team at the bottom of the championship is allowed to make the first bid at the next race. <laughs> so he said, so you'd have Williams bidding for Lewis Hamilton. Um, and then he said, but the point is that he would also introduce an ability for the team to then sell the driver to another team. So there would be a lot of money changing hands, as you can imagine, as the championship started to get a bit heavy. Uh, but you've raised the point, Anam, of how would the drivers actually earn money? And of course, what they would do is take a percentage of, of the money that's traded between the teams. And in addition to all that, they are out there to go and market their own package anyway. So yeah. or if you're a Max Verstappen or a Lewis Hamilton or a Charles Leclerc, it's not going to be that difficult for you to do the deals you want to do with various sponsors, with television companies, whatever it is. You become a marketing property in your own right. And those are the overalls that you take to that car. And the team obviously then goes out and has its own marketing program based on the fact that at some point of the year, it's going to have Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen in the car. Yeah, so of course, yeah. it's a completely different mindset, but I think it could filter down to the lower categories as well. I mean, what do you think? Uh, well, I think maybe Lewis won't like it because <laughs> he's getting paid a lot of money in Mercedes. Oh. And I think, if with the, oh, I, I, well, I think with the drivers who are not earning as much as Lewis, they won't mind it. Maybe they might be earning more money through it. But I think Lewis, because he's got contracts with Mercedes, such a highly financial corporation, you know, if he was doing this auction uh, style, I don't think he, maybe the top drivers will be earning as much as they were with a single contract. But I think what would be quite interesting is if they do, because Formula One now, they're doing the budget cap. And I wouldn't be surprised in, in 10 years, not to much to the extent of Formula E, but if it slowly starts to become closer to like a one make, not one make, but you know, like where more spec parts, you know, mm -hmm. so it keeps the cost down. Yeah. And if it comes to a stage where it's maybe similar to Formula E, but like with more development. I wouldn't be surprised if you see, it would be nice to see in the beginning of the year, like a program, like the driver draw. All the teams are there and like for the year, like you said, and then they auction the drivers, just like they would in the NFL. And maybe teams would have more money to spend on drivers. Yeah. And, or maybe they, maybe they do the draw literally one week before the first race. If the cars are all spec-ish, like spec, and the, the tubs, let's say, were all the same, the, the teams don't need to worry about making the tub around the driver. So they just bid the driver, or I'll have you for the year, Lewis, and then uh, you know, do the seat fit like you would in F3. Like F3, like if I go jump to do a race with motorbike in Silverstone, you're a former, I would just jump, do a seat fit on the, on the Thursday night, jump in, do the race, which is what I did. Do the seat fit, and then, you know, just carry on, you know? Yeah, I yeah, I get that. And I've, and I've also been banging on about how the midfield should be able to buy some sort of template car as well, a Delara or some sort, just to make the, the midfield cheaper and more competitive in Formula One. Not that not, you've still got the option to design and build your own car if you want. Going back to the Lewis Hamilton point, if Lewis was a casualty and in the sense that he didn't want to do it because he wasn't going to earn any money doing it, that would be the only casualty in reality because the sport would be amazing then. You would get, you know, to see Max Verstappen in a Haas actually would be fascinating, would it not? And equally to see Roman Grosjean in a Ferrari would be fascinating. And all those brilliant things would be happening during the course of the year. Okay, some drivers may think, this isn't for me. I'm not going to earn as much money as I should or as I deserve. But Lewis is probably the only one, I think, that would think that way. Yeah, I can't uh, imagine Max would think that way. And I don't think Charles would. And I then, if they don't, nobody else will. I still think Lewis would do it, no problem. Well, but, probably, yeah, uh, I would hope he would. But I, mean, like, but just like, I think I we, all, we, point, all, you know. Sorry. we all we all, we all race because uh, we love what we do. The money yeah. comes as a bonus because we love what we do. We do a good job. Yeah. The money that you get paid is like a bonus. Yeah. Uh, now, 
<laughs> no, I'm just saying like Lewis maybe might fight it. Or the guys like Max and stuff who are earning a lot of money, they maybe like try and fight it a bit. But they'd all do it, like just like I would. I'd love oh, it. Of course, yeah. And I think the benefits for the sport though would way would be way ahead of any of the downsides. Of course there would be some downsides, like the team passing on information to the driver and developing the car in harmony with the driver, all that would go away. But as a show, it would massively improve. It would be a brilliant thing. It would be a different Formula One, of course, but to me, it's one of the solutions they should be looking at in this lockdown period when, we, when we've got an opportunity now to see what the path ahead is. Anyway, enough of that. Um, more questions coming in for you. Um, what's the, this is from C11 Joke 3R. <laughs> I think I pronounced that correctly. In, um, what's the most rewarding thing about being a racing driver? Um, yeah, sorry. sorry. And then the next question is while well in a race, by the way, but I'm not sure that's related. Anyway, yeah. Uh, most rewarding thing about being a racing driver, the feeling that you get when you're driving the car on the edge and you know you're doing a really, really good job and you're on a really fast lap. There's nothing, there's no way to describe it, but it's like a feeling that's almost supernatural that you're not connected to this world. And when you're on a really good lap, all your mind, all your energy, as if all your life, all your past experience, all the DNA you've ever, you know, you've ever done is only focused corner by corner, lap by lap, how fast you can go around that corner. When you're really on it and your mind, body, everything's connected and you're on that quality lap that's ridiculously good, mm. nothing compares to it. And I forget, like when I've done really good quality laps, sometimes I just don't even know what I did. And that's usually the best thing because like you do when it's so good, you're so in the zone that you just can't, sometimes it's just a blank and there's no way to describe it. And every, every, everything else in the world is such a conscious thing. Everything I do in normal everyday life is done consciously with a conscious decision. When you're doing in racing, everything's subconscious and you, you, know, so you do things without realizing. That's why sometimes when you're a younger driver, you make stupid mistakes. Because like running into the back of something, and you sometimes you don't realize why, but su subconsciously you're not going to do it again because you've experienced that. It's hard to describe. It's a, it's another level of thinking. And a question is coming: if if there was no lockdown at the moment and you were racing and it was Ramadan, what would you be doing about fluids in the race? It'd be a hard one to be honest. On the race weekends, I probably wouldn't be fasting uh, because it was it's just too difficult in racing. You lose so much water. It's, it'll be very, very difficult. The three days that I won't fast, what, what we do in Islam, you know, when Ramadan finishes, you have to make those days up. So I'll just do, catch up on those three days after. Okie dokie. Um, symbol resolution. In essence, flow is characterized by the complete absorption in what one does and resulting transformation in one's sense of time. I think that's what you were about. I agree. Yeah. Then, was it not? Yeah, that, that's a more, that's a better way. It's a more smarter way of explaining what I just said, to be honest. <laughs> okay. One more question and then we'll get on to uh, the next phase of our show. RJ Heat says, you know, I'm a big fan following you for a long while. Have you ever felt that your career has not gone as you would have liked or expected, especially coming from such highs in karting? Difficult yeah, question, but you know. No, it's a good question. It's true. A hundred percent. I mean, you look at me, I won everything in karting, uh, same year as Lando, and Lando's an F1 now, and obviously I'm not, so there's obviously something that I'm not doing right. Uh, it's a fair point, and sometimes I think about that to myself. But as I've got older, you know, I've realized everyone's circumstances in life is different, and everything does happen for a reason. Whether, whether I'm supposed to make Formula 1 or not, or whether something happens, and then I end up doing something else completely in life. I don't know, but I just do everything I can with, to the best of my ability. <laughs> And the rest, I leave it down. I really believe, you know, because I'm, I'm a Muslim. I believe in God. And I do everything to the best of my ability. And whatever happens is, is in the hands of God. So, um, but I believe the lessons that I have been going through, I've had a harder experience than maybe some other drivers, you could say. Uh, but I enjoy it. When I look back on those experiences, I enjoy it. It made me who I am today. And if I do get to Formula One, if I do get there, and if, if I do become a world champion, which is what I want to do, and I believe I can be, it will make the victory ever more sweeter because the road to get there was a lot more twisty than everyone else's road. <laughs> you know? so, but it's great. It's a great story. Well, it is. It reminds me a little bit of Nigel Mansell and everything he had to go through to get a competitive Formula One car. Even when he was in Formula One, he spent four years in a relatively uncompetitive team and car. And so it can be done. And uh, it, is, uh, it is amazing to hear you say what you just said, actually. And I'm very, 
impressed, very touched, I think is the right word. Anyway, let's move on to, and please stay with us, Anand, because I think... I'd love to. Probably you'll be a <laughs> well known fan by the end of this, if not beforehand, but you probably know that he was Jacques' father, and he was just this brilliant young Canadian star that suddenly landed on the on the Formula One scene, actually discovered in a European sense by Patrick Tombe and James Hunt when they went over to Canada to a circuit called Trois-Rivières, a street circuit, uh, to do an, a Formula Atlantic race. They were both paid to do it, starting money thing, a bit like going to Macau. And this guy, Gilles, just blew everybody away. And James Hunt came back and said to the Marlborough guys, the Marlborough McLaren guys, you've got to see... Gilles Villeneuve, he's just amazing. So they flew him over. He did a test at Silverstone at the British before the British Grand Prix, and he spun, I don't know, eight times or something, but he was very quick, and he didn't hit anything, and he was all car control, and he was all enthusiasm and brilliance, and he got a Ferrari drive at the end of the year when Nicky Lauda left the team early in 77. That was 76, but 77 he got a Ferrari drive, and finished that year with a massive shunt believe it or not, at Fuji at the first corner, hit the back of Ronnie Peterson's car, went up in the air, and sadly, some bystanders were killed in that accident. So it was a big deal in motor racing at the time, and Jill Villeneuve was synonymous then with big accidents. But he got the drive, and he kept the Ferrari drive in 78, his first full season. And at the end of that year, he won his first Grand Prix, which was his home Grand Prix, the Canadian Grand Prix. It was the last round of the championship then. And, of course, from that moment onwards, he became part of Formula One's folklore. He was just this precious gem that we had and he was just sheer pleasure and fun to be with. He was crazy on the roads. He was brilliant to watch on the circuit. He was a very, very nice guy. He was normal. He was kind. He was just a pleasure. Anyway, 79 South African Grand Prix was the third round of the championship that year and the year began completely in an unexpected way because it was the first year in which everybody had seen the Lotus 79 dominating with its ground effect in 78. So everybody went to ground effect cars in 79. And everybody assumed that Lotus would still dominate because obviously they, they were ahead of the game. But they didn't. Ferrari had a big problem because they had a flat 12 engine. And it was always going to be difficult to get a diffuser to work at the back of the car with such a wide engine, even if it was low with a low center of gravity. So, but they did try to do the best job they could and the car was the T4 and it had its first race here in South Africa in the video we're about to see. But in the first two races, the quick car was the Ligier JS11 Cosworth DFV and it just blitzed the opposition. Jacques Lafitte, absolutely brilliant in that car. And everybody was left in a kind of daze. Williams hadn't got their ground effect car out yet. They were still running the old car. That wasn't gonna come until the Spanish Grand Prix. Brabham had their car out and it wasn't going very, very well. It was the Alpha V12. It should have been good. Gordon Murray designed, Nicky Lauda, Nelson Piquet, great team, but they were not doing very much. And Ferrari still had their old car, but then came the South African Grand Prix and they produced and showed the T4, which was the latest Mauro Fogheri design. They'd been testing it at, at Fiorano, of course, but it came to South Africa for its first public appearance, which is a great circuit on which to do that because you can do so much testing in the week before the race. And that's where, if we can start running the video, that's where we now join Gilles and Jody in the Ferrari 312 T4s, basically putting lots and lots of miles on them around Kailami in the build up to the race. There's Jody in the car. The big question mark was the Renault Turbo. There was there were two of them now in, in the 79 season. Jean-Pierre Jabouille had let to, let, yet to lead a race the car being very unreliable. It was still the old Renault, but it was obviously going to be good. Nelson Piquet there, he's got his full season ahead of him now. Brabham Alpha just hangs a tail out on the Brabham BD48. Another shot of Jody in the T4. The jury was out of whether it was a good looking car or not. Personally, I kind of liked it. There were lots of curves on it, but equally, Autosprint weren't very kind. There's Mario struggling with the 79 at the end of its development, not running much wing, as you can see and not being very quick anyway. Reutemann, Carlos Reutemann having his year at Lotus, having driven for Ferrari, big understeer there. And there's Gilles on the pit wall actually chatting to yours truly, having a bit, I'm not sure what I'm showing, yeah. uh, some load of old rubbish, but anyway, we had a laugh about it. There's a long shot of the straight. I think that's uh, one of the shadows, probably Elio. Jack Lafitte behind him in the Ligier. 
as James Hunt, who switched to Wolf, goes past in the Wolf. All this is from testing and, and practice to build up to the race. And you can get a feel for what South Africa is all about. You've raced there, I think, in... Um, yeah, yeah. There's only some of the corners are still the same, but the rest is so different. And it's such a nice track. They should use it in single seaters. It's incredible track, really. Even yeah, the new well, one, it's not as good as the old one, but it, it's really, really good. Really, really, really it's really just good. had this massive long straight, and just to listen to the engine note as they went past in the pits was just brilliant. We saw Gilles getting in the T4 there. There's Jacques Lafitte coming in in the Ligier. He's a bit perplexed now because he's won those first two races, and then there's Pete Evans in the background, very nice Goodyear engineer. I think he's spying actually, because I think he um, he was involved with he was involved with one of the with the Lotus team as well. Anyway, no problem. Um, Carlos, speaking of Lotus, as Carlos Reutemann not looking very happy with his 79. But Ligier, going back to Ligier, of course, the first thing they did was change the car, try to get lighter bodywork on the JS11, and it started to flex. But they didn't know that in Kyle Army, and they couldn't understand why the car was much less consistent than it had been. There's Colin Chapman with his shirt half unbuttoned, very different from the Colin we used to see in the mid 60s. But there's Mario and Carlos, great team, actually, if you think about it. The Lotus in green after years in black and gold, and before that, Gold leaf colours. Clay Regazzoni being strapped into the 06 Williams. Nicky, I'm just sort of grabbing who all these people as Nicky and Nelson PK following him out in the Brabham Alpha. And Jean Pierre Jaboui whispering to his new teammate Rene Arnoux at Renault. As we go back to Nelson, who's delighted to have a full season of racing with Brabham. And of course, he would inherit the number one driver as Bernie directing things, as you can see. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> Carlos Reutemann's got, it's got Carlos's attention too. Oh, we better listen to Jack. Yeah. Here we go, Jackie. Well, they're called ground effect vehicles, always new names for, for new designs. Uh, I think this has obviously contributed greatly to the increased uh, speeds here, and of course the, the times are much, much faster than they've ever been before here at Kailami. I think uh, the car's really very nice. I, I've driven the wing car, and I think it's very little different to drive than the normal conventional car. It's just that it goes around the corners that little bit better, but certainly they're robust, they seem to be strong, and, and so far they've been showing up very well for uh, mechanical reliability. Jackie looking very Jackie in his feeler shirt. I think this is a close-up of the Lotus 79. Lots of work. It's unusual in green, Martini sponsorship, Mario not happy oh, well. at all. What is this white thing, sir? That's uh, what they call um, medical air. It was basically an airline um, in case the fire extinguisher went off so you could breathe um, yeah. medical air inside the helmet. It was a big thing in Formula One for a while. Patrick Depaye having a laugh. He's enjoying his time at Ligier, as you can imagine. Such a great car. He would win the Spanish Grand Prix in a few weeks' time. As we cut back to Jacques Lafitte, and I think we've got some audio from, from Lafitte as well, which I recorded relatively recently about his feelings for the JS11, and that's Pete Evans, as I said, yeah, he's a Ligier, good year guy. And why they weren't going so well after Argentina and Brazil. When you first drove the JS11, the Ligier, Adrika, Adrika, did it feel beautiful? I stopped after three laps, and I said to Guy and Gerard, I finally, I understood why the, the Lotus was so quick. <laughs> oh, it was incredible. The change was. The problem as the season developed, I think, was the skirts and also flexing of the chassis. Yeah? The, the problem was only this thing. When we go back from Argentina, Brazil, we, we fix a new, a new body car, bodywork, with this wing. But it was so light that it was deformed. When I was quick, and when I stopped... So and the gist of what Jacques is saying there is that Guy Ligier was very upset that the Choulet wind tunnel started to do work with Alfa Romeo, and presumably some of the Ligier drawings went to Alfa. He had a million franc bill to pay to the wind tunnel and decided not to pay it. Result of which, Ligier couldn't do any wind tunnel testing for the rest <laughs> of the They kind of lost the plot. Nice little, beautiful. You see the early turn in there, Jacques yeah, Lafitte. Yeah. That was quite characteristic of Jacques driving, even though he had a bit of a moment in the middle of the corner. Um, and there's, uh, there he is again. He was so good to watch when he was really on it. Really, really good driver. Very like Jean Alesi in his early turn in. And was very underrated, I think, as a racing driver in general. So Nicky Lauda there, his own brand, sunglasses. He would retire from Formula One before 
the end of the year, just into the Canadian Grand Prix after one day's practice. There's Amano Kuogi with no shirt on, his uh, mechanic that he took from Ferrari. Obviously, he was great uh, in the middle of the relationship with Alfa Romeo and helped a lot there. But Nicky not impressed with the power of the engine here in South Africa. It couldn't live with the Ferrari flat 12. And that was the main difference, really. That Ferrari, Brabham was struggling with power all year and reliability as it happened. And it was a terrible season for Nicky Lauda. There's me again on the left. I'm trying to talk to Gilles here. And he, I think he wants to talk to me. But Marco Piccinini in the Michelin cap is trying to drag Gilles away as ever. I'm asking difficult questions, probably. <laughs> James Hunt uh, in the Wolf. Didn't have a great year in the Wolf and qualified midfield in South Africa. There's Jody leading Ricardo Patrese in the Arrows. He has a nice slide coming out of the corner. Don't see that very often. Oh, big shunt for Elio De Angelis going into Crowthorn. Looks as if something probably broke the back of the shadow. Left rear, he gets out. You see the catch fencing that just was everywhere in Formula One then. And, and it was great in some respects. Took a long time to repair. It was expensive. Plus, there was a chance of getting hit by one of the wooden poles. But in this case, of course, Elio's fine, not very happy. But he has a similar shunt in the race, sadly. But he finishes his year going really well. Finished fourth in the US Grand Prix for Shadow. Really good drive in the wet. Jacques Lafitte. Uh, looking really confident, actually waves his hand there. He's still in practice, but then he's putting up a hand signal to thank those two guys for letting him pass. You don't see that very often in Formula no, One no. today. The driver's much more polite than they used to be. Really quick, nice section of road there. That's not, I, I, you use a bit of that track, I think, in the modern circuit, but it's not as it was. No front wing on the Brabham's, which is very typical of the Gordon Murray car. That Why was that? Well, they didn't need it. They had so much downforce, and it was a way of, of getting more top speed out of the car. As I say, they weren't quick on the straight. They were quite disappointed with the Alpha V12 power uh, relative to Ferrari and even Cosworth. So they were doing all they could, and they just set the car up with enough downforce not to, to, to run front wing. Ferrari had that really unusual nose and were ducting air through the front there into the side pods by that front wing. There's Jean-Pierre Jabouille. Patrick Tombay climbs out of his McLaren M28. Pretty disappointing car, the ground effect car, McLaren at the start of the year, and it didn't really get any better. They improved it a little bit, but it wasn't the great ground effect car that it should have been. Another nice shot of uh, James Hunt in the Wolf, followed by Jabouille in the Renault Turbo. And Jabouille, very keen to prove that he's as much a racing driver as that package relies on turbo power, Michelin tires, and a great Francois Castang chassis. And in this race, I think he proved that. This was maybe one of the best races Jean-Pierre Jabouille ever drove. He, he's getting in now into the car, going out for the race. He took the pole, which was not that unexpected given how long the straight was in South Africa and how high the altitude was. But you'll see in a minute what he does off the start line. It is absolutely amazing. The V6... Renault Gordini turbo engine, twin turbo engine, really nice little compact unit, very good for the ground effect shape. Rene Arnoux joining the team, a two-car team for the first time at Renault. And a nice looking team as well, well run, very French, but a big shunt for Didier Peroni in the Tyrrell. And Brian Lyle there on the right, one of the engineers having a look, not very impressed with what he could see. There was no report of anything having broken on the car, I remember, when that happened, and we just assumed that it was DDA, who was always on the edge. He was very Roman Grosjean-esque sort of driver. Uh, Roger Hill not looking very happy either there, but uh, Patrick Depaillet wearing his GPA helmet, which mm -hmm. was an unusual French helmet, which unclipped underneath the chin, front and back. But Gilles later switched to GPA, actually. There he is with his bell helmet. James Hunt with a small opening with his Bell as well. Alan Jones still in the 06. Williams and Ligier cut to Nicky Lauda. These are shots of all the drivers getting ready on to get out of the grid for the start of the race. So we have Jabouille on the pole. Jody Schechter qualified second alongside him as we follow, I think, Mario out. There's Carlos in the Lotus 79. Jody goes out in the T4. The crowd loved Jody. He was the local hero, of course. Nelson Piquet, who we think of so often as a number one driver, but he was, of course, the junior number two to, to Nicky Lauda there and had to give one of his sets of qualifying tyres to Nicky. <laughs> Would you believe? 
<laughs> they're supposed to get two each, but Nelson only ended up with one, and Nicky Lauda had three, which was one of the reasons he is on the second row there for Brabham Alpha. So there's Jaboui on the pole. Jody gets the jump, and you can see Gilles made quite a good start down the inside as well. And they come over the crest, and Gilles is on the inside. Jaboui's moving to the left to go to the outside. Schechter thinks he's got it fully covered now. He's got the inside run into the first corner. Jody Schechter, the crowd hero. And look at Jaboui, stays on the outside, runs around the outside of Jody Schechter, stays with him. We don't see it, but he stays with him until they get to clubhouse, around the outside, and is leading as they finish the first lap. So I think that shows how good a driver Jean-Pierre Jaboui was. Correction, racing driver Jean-Pierre Jaboui was. Around the outside of Jody Schechter in South Africa, doesn't come easy. And that was one of the most impressive bits of driving we would see all year. But suddenly, within a lap or two, it starts to rain. Jaboui massively in trouble with the turbo, of course, leaving the two Ferraris in front. They're tiptoeing around, going very, very slowly. Visibility is absolutely terrible. Nobody had thought about this. Nobody had predicted the rain. It just suddenly happened, as it does in, in South Africa. And the race is red flagged. It's only two or three laps old. It's not raining very much at the start finish line, as you can see, but nonetheless, they're going to stop the race and everybody's going to come in and switch to wet tyres. You can see a little bit of the spray coming out the back of the cars. But Jody Schechter has already decided, as Hans Stuck in the ATS, Schechter's already decided that the grip in the wet on the Michelin slicks is so good that if there's any chance of the rain easing off, he's going to restart on slicks, whereas Gilles is going to start restart the race on the Michelin wet tyres. Ferrari splitting their options. That's the ATS, the yellow ATS. Sorry, that's the Renault uh, getting its Michelin wet tyres. And there's Jared LaRousse looking very cool, the team manager of, well, the team principal of Renault, as we'd call him today, looking at the slicks on Jody Schechter's car. And of course, Gilles gets all the grip off the line now. He's on the pole and he gets the grip off the line in the wet, on the wet Michelins. And he pulls away at about two seconds a lap. It looked impressive, but Talking to Gilles later, he, he kicked himself at this point of the race for not actually going a lot quicker. He was holding the revs back. He was braking early. He knew he had a big advantage. He wasn't going to do anything silly, but he wished that he had had a much bigger lead when the track started to dry, and it was obvious that he was going to have to change to slicks. The lead wasn't big enough. And uh, and there, there goes John Watson in the Marlborough McLaren. Bit of a moment there, but he rejoins relatively Okay, Patrick Tombe in the other car there going round. So Kyle Army starts to dry out. There's Gilles still leading the race on the wet tyres, pulling away. But Jody Schechter, amazingly good in the Ferrari, holds P2 on slicks. So it's kind of all done and dusted at this point. Jody's driven so well on those slicks that he's bound to win the race when Jill has to come in to change to dry tyres. A very slow pit stop for Carlos Reutemann in the Lotus 79. He also has brake trouble, so a terrible weekend. Or Lotus with the aging 79. They put all their effort into the Lotus 80, but that wasn't a car that was ever really going to do very well. It did well in its first race in Spain, and that was about it. It went from bad to worse. So a great, uh, great disappointment for Lotus. A shunt here for Jan Lammers, who's now one of the major players of the Dutch Grand Prix, relaunch of the Dutch Grand Prix, as we're going to know it, in Formula One. But Jan, very good racing driver in his own right. He's just shunted with Hector Rabak there, his Lotus 79 being pushed back into the race. That's the 70, the original 79 chassis one that Mario used to love more than any other car, the 78 car. Uh, but Jan Lam is out of the race with his shadow. There's Gilles, still on wet tyres, but very annoyed that he's going to have to come in and switch to slicks. And uh, a nice bit of movement there from Rennie Anu in the Renault. Nice overhead shot here. That's Crowthorn corner. They break at the end of the long straight. The tightish right-hander, then down the hill through that very quick right. Sadly, it was the bottom of there in 1974 that Peter Revson lost his life at testing in the shadow, hit the guardrail on the outside when the left front uh, bolt broke in the suspension. So here's Dodi Schechter now leading the race easily because Gilles had to come in for dry tyres. Here's the second shunt for Elio De Angelis. The car's back the other way around now, the shadow. Not a great weekend for Elio, but as I say, his season would get better. Is Gilles climbing through the field now, leading the pack, bit of opposite lock in the middle of the corner, and he gets to within four seconds of Jody Schechter. He's much quicker because he's on fresher tyres, but Ferrari have said, if you are near Jody, stay within four seconds. And it, the same would have applied to Jody at that point. They didn't want the two drivers racing, and Gilles being the ethical sportsman that he was, stuck exactly to that. But then guess what? Jody, Jody's tyres went off. He flat spotted the tyre. He had to come in, 
changed to another set of dry tyres and Gilles Villeneuve inherited the win. Well, won the race actually, won it really well given everything he'd done that weekend and won the South African Grand Prix. He's waving to the crowd there. Jody Schechter recovered brilliantly to finish second. So it's a Ferrari 1-2 with the 312T4. There's the crowd in front of the podium. They're all shouting for Jody, but there's Gilles Villeneuve. Doesn't get much better than that. Gilles with the Michelin cap. Podium ceremonies weren't terribly organized back then. It was pretty free for all, but why not? It was a lot of natural energy coming out. Jean-Pierre Jarrier on the right, driven brilliantly for Tyrrell to finish third. Really good in the wet to great drive by Jarrier. Jill sprays the champagne as you would. Jarrier nicks the bottle. Probably another bottle going to materialize pretty quickly. And coming up in a second, we have sound bites from the winner of the race, Phil Villeneuve. What do you think of that? Um... Very, very nice. I was surprised that he was able to win still being on the on the wets. To be well, honest. yeah. I, I mean, he wasn't going to win so long as Jody just stayed out on his dry mm. tires, obviously. But he he was brilliant when he got back onto his slick, Jill, the one three fives, yeah. and he in the way he caught Jody, he got within four seconds of Jody, and then he just sat there. Uh, and you can imagine if Sebastian Vettel was in that situation today, and his tires were much fresher and. Charles Leclerc in front, his tyres had gone off and he was all over the place. You would imagine what would be going on. But Gilles just sat there very patiently, knowing that he was going to finish second to Jody Schechter. But Jody locked to front, massive tyre vibration, tyres had gone off. He had to come in for that second set of drives. And Gilles, in a way, paced the race perfectly in that sense, because the Michelin tyres... At that point of the of the year, when well, actually for most of the year, it was difficult to get a Michelin tire to run the full race distance consistently. They're always going to go off at some point. So okay. part of Gilles' thinking when he chose the wets for the restart was that probably if he started on slicks, they weren't going to be perfect till the end of the race anyway. So that was, you know, in that sense, I think Gilles deserved to win that race. It was a very impressive day for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we've had a good point, uh, actually, from Diego Moreno saying Gilles won that race. He then won the Long Beach Grand Prix, the US Grand Prix West, two weeks later. So two wins for Gilles right at the start of the year. And then it went away from him. And Jody eventually won the championship that year. When did it all change for Gilles, he asks. And I think it changed, actually, around very early on when Gilles had a problem at Zolder. Actually, it was Jody induced. Jody and Clay Regazzoni had a shunt on the first lap and Jody slowed right down as a result. And Jill, well, Jill hit the back of Clay, that's right, and damaged the front and had to come in. And then he ran out of fuel and Jody had, Jody won the race. So that was a bad thing for Jill. And then they got to Monaco and Jill was really quick on Friday, Thursday and Friday. And Saturday, though, they took a long time to change. They had a fuel problem, fuel pressure problem on Jill's car. They took longer than really they should have to fix it when the track was at its quickest. Jody got the pole, and that was it, really. And from that moment, you got the feeling Ferrari thought that Jody was the experienced Formula One driver, even though it was his first year at Ferrari. And Jill was still the young understudy. And basically, Jody was the number one after that. It was never yeah. said, but I got that feeling. And it all came to a head at Zandvoort when jo Gilles had that, that famous moment when he's got three wheels on the car and he drives the thing back to the pits and there are sparks everywhere. Every, everyone's probably seen that. That was Gilles' frustration in the situation, actually, because he knew that his only chance to get ahead of Jody was to get another car between him and Jody so that there would never be any need to have to let Jody in front. So even though his tyres were going off, he had Alan Jones behind him going really quickly in the Williams. Gilles had two choices at that point. He could either do the logical thing, which is let Jones go, sit behind him, make the tyres last and finish Ferrari second and third. But if he did that, he was going to have to let Jody in front. 
So he took the other option, which was to try and stay in front of Alan Jones when his tyres were going off. And sure enough, he spun, damaged a rim, and then the tyre blew. And that's what that was all about. That's why he drove that car back in. He knew he was never going to get out, out again. He damaged the suspension with all the tyre flailing around. But that was his way of saying, I'm in an impossible situation here. Uh, because Ferrari wouldn't say publicly that Jody was the number one driver. But equally, Gilles knew by that point that he was, unless he changed things himself. So it was a, it was a really difficult time. Diego, I hope that kind of answers the question. Um, but those cars... Those cars are um, nicer. A lot of mm. a lot of downforce. A lot of downforce. I mean, I remember Alan Jones saying he could barely hold the wheel on his on his pole lap of Silverson. It was the delos were so high. But at the same time, they moved around and they were you know they were great race cars and they didn't seem to have any problem overtaking with them either. I don't know why. It's an interesting point, isn't it? Skirts. Peter Wright, who invented skirts on the Lotus 79, 78 actually, says that it's because of skirts. Because they had skirts on the cars, it was much easier to follow the car in front and to overtake. Yeah, maybe they should do a rule to run a lot less aerodynamic pieces on top of the car, like wings, etc. cetera. Yeah, make well, them a lot less, but just put the skirts. Yeah, or really strong skirts, floor. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, uh, Rob Graham says, Damn it, I've just missed most of this, but thank you for doing it, Peter. But that's, that doesn't matter. You can see the reruns. You'll see the rerun of this complete show within a few minutes on the YouTube channel, and then I'll be doing edits, getting all my bloopers out, and um, it'll be much more fun to watch. And don't forget, there's also on the podcast, there's me describing the race as I saw it with my notes as well, and, and I hope you'll enjoy that. Um, there are actually quite a lot of questions about the Southern Grand Prix as well coming in um oh yeah uh, peter the other day watching an interview with a gill mechanic he said that carlos reutemann convinced enzo not to fire gill <coughs> excuse me have you discussed this with carlos while being alongside him yeah that is an absolutely true story um at the end of 77 enzo ferrari said to carlos who is this guy? I open Gazzetta della Sport, the Italian newspaper, and I see my car upside down flying in the air in Japan. Who is this guy that, we were, Gilles Villeneuve, yeah. that I've got driving for me? And Carlos, Carlos said then, I remember I was with him. Um, he, he, I was on the phone and, and he said, um, oh, guys, wonderful. You've got to keep him. He, he, don't worry about it. You know, these things happen. He's a young kid, but he will get better. And so at that point, I think there was a moment when Enzo thought that may, he may not keep Jill for 78, but I think Carlos kept him alive then. And then secondly, when when Jody Schechter was signed by Ferrari for 79, it was like two thirds of the way through 78, Carlos could have stayed at Ferrari, in which case Jill would have gone to McLaren or Wolf. And Carlos had Gilles' career in his hand, a little bit like Michael Schumacher when Ferrari had signed Kimi Raikkonen. He knew that if he continued, Felipe Massa would. And some of us believe that one of the reasons Michael retired from Ferrari was in order to keep Felipe Massa there. They were very close and very good friends and still are and, and had a lot of respect for one another. And Carlos did the same thing. He, you know, he, I remember I was chatting to him. I was in i was in the south of france i was talking to carlos on the phone and he said if i if i stay at ferrari that's it for Gilles, and that's a big thing i need to think about that and he did leave ferrari and he went to lotus and yeah and he kept Gilles' career alive there so i'm not sure Gilles ever knew that i don't think he did I think, you know, from Jill was just a simple, straightforward racing driver and he just saw everything in front of him as it happened and he did the best he could at any given moment. But there's another point I'd like to make about that South African Grand Prix, and I think you would understand this, Anand, and that is that there's a very good example relatively early on in Jill's career of him respecting Jody Schechter as the race leader and giving him that four seconds cushion, even though he's on better tires, fresher tires, and Jody's obviously in trouble. We know then that Jody came in and Jill won the race, but he was prepared to finish second, even that early in the year, because he was four seconds behind him as the way the race had evolved. 
And if you see that sort of ethic in Gilles' mind, it wasn't the first time he was going to do that sort of thing. He did that a lot. And of course, he let, in a way, he let Jody win the championship at Monza in 79 because he could have raced Jody there, but he didn't. He just drove to support Jody winning the Drivers' Championship. And I remember Carlos, before that race, Carlos took Gilles to one side and said, look, I know what you're going to do. I know you're going to help Jody. I know you're going to be the good number two. But remember this, Jill, you don't get many chance to win a world championship. And sometimes you've got to do what you've got to do in order to win. And what Carlos was saying was, don't help Jody, go and race. Um, but Jill didn't take his advice. He didn't listen to him, actually, and, and did what he did. <laughs> and of course, Jill was always thinking, oh, I'll win the world championship the following year and Jody will help me. But the following year, the Ferrari was rubbish and they were completely uncompetitive. So in a way, Carlos was right. But just going back to the point I was making about ethics, you can understand now why when Didier Peroni did at Imola in 82, you can understand why Gilles was devastated because it never entered his head that any other driver, let alone teammate of his, would ever betray him the way Peroni did and ignore team orders and team agreements and just keep passing Gilles every time Gilles backed off to save fuel. And that was why Gilles was so upset after that race. And that's why he went to Zolda so angry. And that's probably why at Zolda, he made a decision on the spur of the moment not to back off when he saw a slower car in front of him because he had no more sets of qualifying tires. And he just decided to pass Jock and Mass on the side at which Mass suddenly moved over on him in qualifying. I think if Imola had never happened, I don't think Gilles would have made that pass. I think he would have backed out of it and yeah. said, right, Mass has screwed my lap. Peroni's ahead of me on the grid, but you know, I'll, I'll outrace him or whatever. But I think it was because of Imola that Gilles took that risk and because he was devastated that anybody could do that. And I think, you know, I say this to you, Anand, because I respect you as a as an honourable moral person. And I think, you know, I suspect in your situation, you would probably be of Gilles' mind, I think. You would respect other drivers and you would respect agreements, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I have done that before. Well, yeah. Me. yeah, I've done before, yeah. And that's what and that's what Gilles Villeneuve was all about. And that's what comes through more than anything else, I think, in that seven. Well, I never I never did it if if it, if it, if I thought it would compromise myself being uh, a champion. Uh if I already had something in the bag and uh like the championship was pretty much secured for me, then I would you know, then I'd uh, have like an agreement like I think karting once I, I let one of my teammates like win. Like when I was 12 or something. That's the last time I've done something like that. <laughs> you know? Well, as Carlos, you know, Carlos made the point. Championships are, are di slightly different things. But, you know, it never entered Jill's head not to respect Jody Schechter. So what can I say? Um, lots of questions coming in. I don't think we're going to get to be able to answer more because we've been going on for quite a long time. But Louis Martin says... Hi, Peter. When I read a lot of Doug Nye's material, I get the impression that he doesn't rate Jill as highly as you do. However, he really likes Ronnie Peterson. Who do you think is better? Um, I can't speak for Doug. What I can speak for are quite a lot of the British teams at the time, and maybe that filtered through to the way Doug thinks. If you take Williams, for example, or even Alan Jones as a very precise example, he, he thought he was crazy, but he didn't think he was a great racing driver. And I don't think Williams did either. And I say Williams because they were such a major force at that point. And I think that it was very easy to pigeonhole Gilles like that. In the same way, it's easy to pigeonhole Nigel Mansell as a determined, brave racing driver without talking about how sensitive he is in a racing car and how quick he was in variable conditions, for example. And I think the same with Gilles. I mean, to, to me, Gilles was a very complete racing driver very, very fast. I wouldn't have said Ronnie was quicker than Jill. That's my feeling. I'm a, I, was a, you know, I was a massive Ronnie fan. I was a massive Jill Vilner fan, but it didn't stop me respecting both of them enormously. I would say Jill was slightly better at managing the racing game, at getting good people around him, at being in a just making the team work and, and infecting people with enthusiasm and understanding what the package required. Whereas I think Ronnie was just this glorious talent that you just plugged into a car and he was just mega quick. But often he would be mega quick, but only in the middle of the grid because the car wasn't very good. 
of course, Jules did find himself in those situations, but not as often as Ronnie. So, I don't know. I would never want to say one is better than the other, but I would never say Jules was any less of a driver than Ronnie Peterson. No way. Uh, where do we get your podcast, Peter? It's a it's a it's called Podbean.com. Apparently, it's huge. <laughs> he says, not knowing much about podcasts. But anyway, I'll put the uh, the link in the description at the bottom of this. It's very easy to find, I think. I've done one test uh, podcast on there, which was last week's show, actually. Um, so hopefully, it will be there. Um, and Rob Graham says, yes, I believe that's true about Massa. Yeah. Um, Igor Brezovic, in answer to the Ronnie Jill, says, Jill, any day of the week. Um, another name, Ali says they were all awesome drivers back then. Um, Peter, I've answered this question before, but would you have ever gone in a helicopter with Jill? Answer, I didn't and I wouldn't, nor would I go in one of these massive powerboat things either. <laughs> no way. Road cars with Jill was enough, nothing else. True, true. Um, loving the show as ever. Hello from Madrid and Valencia. Loving it from California. How well liked was Gilles amongst his Formula One peers? Well, I've kind of answered that a little bit. Carlos loved him. He loved him. I think Mario did too. I don't think, I think a lot, a lot of that British thing, which started with, you know, the guy's just crazy. He's not a polished talent. I think that kind of permeated the brains of quite a lot of the drivers, I guess. But... Nah. I mean, Jody Schechter really respected Jill. And I was talking to Jody at Monza last year. We were talking about Jill. And he said, look, he said, I would try and do a Jody accent. He said, he said, Jill Villeneuve, you know, my, all my time with Jill, I don't think I ever had one crossed word with him. And he was my friend. And I trusted him. And I think he trusted me. And I was with him for two years. And we had the perfect relationship. And it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because there's two world-class drivers in the same team and they got on doesn't happen very often but they got on only because Jill became subservient I guess in the championship year 79 and gave the championship to Jody that's why they got on but um I think if but I think Jody got quite cross with Jill after that Zolder thing and I think actually after the Dijon the famous race of Dijon when Jill was wheel banging with René Arnoux for the last three or four laps and Jill won the battle when uh, Rennie just left the door open going into the hairpin on the last lap. Um, after that race, Jody said to Jill, look, you're going to drive like that and you're going to end up in trouble. You've got, to, you've got to change your ways and become more mature and not do that. So as much as we celebrate that battle, the Arnu vilner battle at Dijon, there was Jody Schechter saying, this is not right. This shouldn't happen. And uh, stop it. I'm not sure if you'll listen to him, of course. I don't think he did it. Uh, we're nearly over an hour. I know you're desperate to get away and have a no, no, no. What do you get? The, what is it? The lamb that's cooking? A fish? Chicken. No, no, chicken. Chicken, that's right. Love from Nigeria. Thank you, Peter. Bright eyes. Same here, Rob. Saw he's winning Canada 78. I was hooked. Good impression. Blah, blah, blah. Not blah, blah, blah. It's all wonderful stuff. Thank you so much. But I think we're kind of getting at the end. There's just a couple of general questions. Um, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you, Peter, can you spot the driver's driving style from TV coverage or when you're on the track? I have actually answered that one before. So watch that. Listen to that podcast. I think I go into that. But the bottom line is it's very difficult to do it from television because the angles the TV directors choose are there to make the cars look good, the scenery look good, the advertising look great, and to make Formula One look wonderful. But they're not there to show turn-in points or steering movement relative to brake pedal pressure release, all that stuff you've got to be out on the circuit for. And uh, it's getting increasingly difficult to find good places on the circuit too with all the fencing. Don't don't um, don't fall asleep, Anam. No, <laughs> no, one more question and then we seriously owe it. Um, this was, uh, do you believe that the balance of power between the teams, this is from Mr. Diesel Akius, the balance of power between the teams is controlled by the FIA making the championship fixed? i.e. Mercedes Pirelli tire test in 2014 with Hamilton. Um, <laughs> what do you think? Do you think it's fixed enough? <laughs> I don't want to say, don't want to say anything. It cost me a job. <laughs> yeah, it might, might jeopardise your career. Let me answer. I think, um, as I said before, yeah, Bernie always knew that you had to look after Ferrari in order to make Formula One work. I'm not sure the current owners of Formula One feel the same way, but they are certainly 
being a commercial entity who want to make money, they're certainly open to the power and the money of all the big teams. Not open to it, but they're aware of it. And so presumably that has some sort of effect at some point. But I would guess Mercedes have more weight than, I don't know, Haas, I would guess. But I'm not sure that means anything. I think, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know what to say about that, really. I'm, I'm a bit like an arm, really. I want to keep my job, so I'm not saying anymore. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I think that's it. I'll put the uh, link for the podcast in there. Hope you enjoyed the show. Thanks for watching. See you next week. I know, it's fine.